Welcome to Garden DC, the podcast about everything gardening in the Washington DC and Mid-Atlantic region. I'm your host, Kathy Jentz. I'm the editor of Washington Gardener Magazine, and we're aimed at gardening enthusiasts, people who grow everything from edibles to ornamentals, natives to exotics. If it grows in our area, that's what we talk about. Welcome to episode 107 of the Garden DC podcast. In this episode, we talk with Kirk R. Brown as Frederick Law Olmsted, who was renowned as an American landscape architect, journalist, social critic, and public administrator. You'll definitely want to tune in for Olmsted's thoughts on public spaces. The plant profile is on Serviceberry, and we share what's going on in the garden as well as some upcoming local gardening events. This episode of Garden DC, we are thrilled to be joined by Frederick Law Olmsted on the occasion of his 200th birthday. Welcome, Frederick. Well, my word, good morning. Oh, how wonderful it is to be up, active, and vital on this beautiful summer day. You know, in, in a certain capacity, I can look back over these 200 years and remember something that I said many years ago is that that a man who sees things differently than the mass of ordinary men is classified thus. He has a defect of the eye, a defect of the brain. So I have been able to excuse myself over these same 200 years by just thinking, well, I am unlike the rest of the population in that I can think and see things entirely through different eyes. Wonderful. And I think I was a little bit cheeky in calling you Frederick. Should I be addressing you as Mr. Olmsted? I, I, would, I, I respond to most things. <laughs> uh, one of my neighbors in Hartford, where I grew up and was formed, was uh, someone that you would know of as Mark Twain. He answered as to almost anything in his life, but his real name was Samuel Clemens. He said at one point that of all the things he'd lost, he missed his mind the most. I, I ascribe to that philosophy. <laughs> well, that is wonderful to have such a uh, charming and witty neighbor to be able to discourse with Mr. Olmsted. Yes, because I can always point to his failings and then none will recognize <laughs> my own. So on this episode, uh, we are going to talk about your accomplishments, your life, and on the Garden DC podcast, we like to dial it back all the way to baby Frederick and ask, were you born with chlorophyll in your veins and a green thumb, or did that come later in life for you? It came much later. I, I was 35 and still trying to find my way in the world, having tried many things. If, if you look at all of the things that I am credited with, you have a huge list of, of, well, some would call them accomplishments. I would just say another try and fail. But the, of the list that I am most proud of, the beginning of the urban public parks movement, I was the first to design life-affirming residential subdivisions I also designed one of the world's first successful world's fairs. You know, many people can design and aspire to a world's fair, but it's a whole other topic to actually make money and have millions of people come to enjoy it. I also designed green belts. It is not enough to do a park or a garden. They need to be interconnected so that people can travel from one place to another, surrounded by that green, through the use of parkways, which were a new concept in the day. I was also committed to public health and sanitation, clean water, clean facilities, the use of of federal funding to improve the common man's lot in health. 
I was an originator with all of the, the founders of the American Red Cross throughout the Civil War. I helped organize, catalog, inventory, and promote the concept of national parks and managed forestry, the largest of which was a project with the Vanderbilts down in Asheville that you call Mount Pisgah National Forest right now. I was also at an early forefront of garden communication when Andrew Jackson Downing uh, pointed to me and said, why don't you write a couple of articles on that agricultural thing you do? And I promoted Cemetery Arboreta. That means a place where people could go to commune with their deceased loved ones and family members, especially after the Civil War when this nation was so greatly hurting. I believed in riparian restoration and you have but to go to the back bay and the fens in Boston to see how what was an open sewer turned into a mildly beautiful fresh waterway. And I believed in early sustainable products and practices. How can you leave behind a world that is far better and greater than the one that we've inherited through environmental health, an enormous concept, possibly even greater today than it was in the 1850s and 60s when we were first building Central Park. And, and I think to the benefit of, of much of our officially designed and registered garden spaces, I was one of a founding group of members of the American Society of Landscape Architects, which was codified in a, a lecture syllabus that my son, Ricky Frederick Jr., wrote for the first practicable graduate course in landscape architecture at Harvard University. At the time, I, I felt somewhat proud of the fact that I, I stole a bit of Gilbert and Sullivan to say that I was the very model of a major modern man. <laughs> and, and yet, that's how I have to look back on it. 1822, 200 years ago, the world did not recognize that I was born. What it recognized at that time in that world was that Napoleon died. It was the end of the Napoleonic era. It, it was the sunset of French revolutionary and European warfare that was carried on for more than a generation in that time. And, and what we had was an opening, uh, an, a, an entirely new world that was facing the prospects of what we would become in a better life. And I think America took up the handle quite thoroughly. One of my mentors was Andrew Jackson Downing, as I had mentioned. He wrote the first book. I think it's, it's still a preeminent book. He titled it A Treatise on the Theory and Practice of Landscape Gardening. You will find it free from most sources as the primary source edition, and it appeared in 1841. Within those pages, Downing said such things as a good home will encourage its inhabitants to pursue a moral existence. In Europe, we were at the forefront of the Romantic era, Beethoven, the art world under the, the heavy weight of Romantic images of Edens restored. But in this country, Andrew Jackson Downing used the word picturesque landscape. Continuing, he, it has a great advantage for us. The raw materials of woods, water, and surface by the margin of many of our rivers and brooks are at once appropriated with so much effect and so little art in the picturesque mode and the charm so great.
There is a moral influence to a country home, and all of us should aspire to it. So a lot of the listeners for this podcast might have a a city home or urban home, but they would be able to enjoy that country home through those parks and other facilities that you alluded to. And we have much to be grateful for, for that, for that access to green space. Um, How do you think that actually affects us morally? So if we were to spend our entire lives just in the city and not exposed to those green spaces, how does that impact a person? I think the exemplar is the first. And if you go back to, I'll call them, the roots of urban horticulture and the development of the great Central Park of New York. It was a civic commission. Originally, Andrew Jackson Downing went to the the grand uh, Dutch elders who ruled the state uh, politics in Albany, and he proposed to them that, that what New York needed was a place for people to enjoy the green spaces. And and I believe a proper city park should provide escape from the city. Downing actually said it much better when he said, plant spacious parks in your cities and unclose their gates as wide as the gates of morning to the whole people. For the first time in the world, and a city park was built with municipal funds, state funding, in order to provide entirely 100% free public access to any citizen of the city. You know, our, our history and the history of those types of controlled natural environments goes back to the aristocratic hunting lodges of very affluent and royal people in our European heritages. What happened in New York was that for once, you didn't have to preserve and protect from the commoners all of this multitude of green space. You allowed them to come in. And as that, it was a pressure relief valve. People, for the first time, on the day that they had off, could escape their small, narrow confines of urban inner city housing and go to the great out of doors in 800 acres that was filled with, as Downing called it, the great uh, triumvirate, water, grass, and woods. And in those days, the sheep's meadow in Central Park was actually mowed by live sheep. Well, that would make maintenance so much easier and nicer today not to have you know those whining uh, leaf blowers and other machines going on and be able to have a more tranquil experience uh, in those parks just don't wear good shoes <laughs> yes i was gonna say and you also had the benefit of some extra manure there on the lawn let's talk about because most of our listeners are going to be based in the Mid-Atlantic and D.C. area, perhaps some of your projects that you have taken on here, and two that listeners might be familiar with, Rock Creek Park and Mm. the U.S. Capitol Grounds in particular. Well, thank you for reminding me of some of the great collaborations of my life and also of the lives of my children. For the better part of 100 years, and Olmsted was involved in federal projects um, within and throughout the Washington capital city. And, and with that, again, you have to consider that the park is a democratic development of the highest significance. It is, it is one great purpose of any park to supply to the hundreds of thousands of tired workers a specimen of God's handiwork that shall be to them what a month or two in the White Mountains is to those in more affluent circumstances. And always, through all of the designs, whether in partnership with Calvert Vox or in partnership with John, my adopted eldest son, or Frederick, my youngest natural-born son, 
through all of us, through that partnership, we were seeking the three grand elements of picturesque landscape, grass, water, and woods. And if you put all of those together in an appropriate equilibrium, you develop to the general public a space that is far greater than any of the individual elements. Into the next generation, you know, Washington was a construction site for much of its history, but in the, the time shortly following the Civil War, <clears throat> they came to me and said, would I consider designing the West Front of the Capitol building? You know, up till that time, all of the access to the Capitol grounds was through the Eastern Front. They had finished the dome during the war, and afterwards, the West Front was a jungle, a mass of plantings that, that sloped downhill to what was essentially a swamp. Hmm. They asked me to provide them with a design for that acreage that would accommodate all of the new philosophy. I, I, know, it's, I know it's argued whether Horace Greeley ever penned, go west, young man, go west. But whether he did or not, the fact that they wanted to make the capital west facing acknowledged the fact that we were a country on the move, growing up and growing out, and our future lay with all of the western reserves. So, yes, I took on that project. I, I can't say I was entirely thrilled with how it all came out, because although I started the design and and the discussions with those legislators who were involved sometime after the war and before 1874. It was only with an act of Congress in 1874 that work was begun, but it took them until 1892 to complete what should have been a project of no more than five years standing. Of course, Central Park took much less than that. I felt at the time that in short, the capital of the Union manifests nothing so much as disunity. But then, of course, you realize that nothing much changes in history. <laughs> no. And so visiting the Capitol grounds today, what aspects are still there from your original design? Everything that is to the west of the building for 270 acres, all of the ellipses, all of the platforms and landings, all of the, the great architecture of space, the layout of the fountains, and all of the staircases, those grand staircases that allow us to pause and reflect on the civility of this great union. You know, many people over these years have taken to think of it as America's front lawn. And what plays out on those acres are very much at the forefront of what is breaking news on any given 24-hour cycle. If you look at it, most of our major patriotic celebrations are held with that as the background. Mm -hmm. And, and if you ever sit there on a major holiday with the thousands of others that gather for the celebration, you'll recognize how great an opportunity it is to celebrate with fellow citizens the effectiveness of public urban horticulture. It's an invisible element, but there and practicable nonetheless. The next generation, let's, let's talk about children and what we leave for them. Mm -hmm. My youngest son, Rick, officially changed his name to Frederick Law Olmsted so that there would be continuity in the firm. He was a member of the Macmillan Commission that defined what was the future development of the great grand lawns of the Smithsonian front porch. So in the connection of the space from the west 
front of the Capitol building to that great new monumental piece of recognition to Abraham Lincoln in his memorial through the connected space of the Washington Monument, all of that green space was effected by the inclusion of Frederick Law Olmsted in the commission planning. People are so grateful to be able to enjoy all of that today. We had a little too much grass for my liking, but <laughs> that's what you have to do these days. Yes, and I was going to say they almost enjoy it too much because there is a lot of wear and tear on that national lawn. Yes, it's true. And for the homeowner uh, who might be listening, what advice would you give to them for their own small landscape? Because you're designing in multiple, multiple acres, but to create a picturesque landscape in say a half acre, is that possible? Absolutely. I think the greatest challenge we face as a generation is the consideration of nature as a handmaiden to our quality of life. I think you need to go out into whatever space you have, whether it's a half an acre or a teacup, and have to decide how we can add first just one plant, the biggest plant you can imagine having, add that plant and then visit it regularly and see if it doesn't qualify as a life force to you. Tend a plant and you can understand some of our, let's say craziness about ornamental horticulture. I would propose that many of the international movements to plant trees can be only as effective as each individual household views the importance of planting a tree for our grandchildren's generation. I consider them legacy trees. And if you look at the development of the National Parks Movement, at one time the federal government was very much involved with setting aside vast acreage to preserve and protect the tree canopy of those wild spaces. You know, I worked with John Muir on an early inventory of Yosemite. And in that experience, he was of the opinion that the federal uh, acreage that was included in the survey needed to be set aside and locked off against any public encroachment, including the, the John Q. public. So Muir's position was that we should not open national parks for public use and recreation. Hmm. I was just the opposite in feeling that it should be open to all people for all public use and restricted to developmental uses and industrialization from commercial interests, which was obviously that which survived into the final uh, set-asides. And so for the homeowner looking at some of these spaces, would they be able to use, obviously, the water, the land, and tree groupings in their landscape, but on a much smaller scale, of course, maybe just one grouping? Yes. I, I think so many... So many of our plant breeders, hybridizers, those that select the new plants for introduction, I think so much of our common cause in um, ornamental horticulture is designed for those smaller lot users. So plants are being cultivated that will grow vigorously in smaller areas with more color and more constant color throughout a season rather than just one bloom there are rebloomers and trees too have been selected for certain types of environments where you can buy dwarfs or understory or or small or small shrubs in, in our history that have now been cultivated to grow as large and ornamental shrubs or hedges so that 
all of these new introductions are to be taken seriously, especially for the new home gardener, because they are almost effortless in their ability to grow within their zones. My strongest suggestion is that people should just go out and get their hands dirty hmm. by putting something in the ground somewhere. And ultimately, dedicating a portion of your thoughts and emotions to the positive value of including nature in your view. So true. And are there particular plants that you gravitate to? Do you have a favorite tree that you often use in your design or shrub? Well, you're talking to a person who wasn't necessarily the plant specifier. There were a lot of people with much more information than I. Mm -hmm. My hope was that the plant be successful, whatever was installed. If you drive through Biltmore in Asheville, North Carolina, you will see on that drive into the house a number of stands of nearly wild bamboo. I was one of the first people here in this country to use bamboo successfully in landscapes because it was unstoppable. There are some things I regret, not the concept of planting an unstoppable plant, but in the concept of necessarily introducing non-native species. Still, if the plant dies, you are not encouraging gardeners' optimism. So I do gravitate to those plants that I can read about and see trialed across this country and other countries. I can also parse through, you know, whole reams of information about what those plants are that are invasive, like the kudzu we introduced here to take care of certain other problems that mm -hmm. resulted in problems of their own. And depending where you are, all of the issue of, of what I feel is a weed species, those, those grand calorie pears that now line all of our major highways because they are so invasive, but yet so beautiful. What is there to be done? A modicum of knowledge, a major investment in the emotional return on green planted things, and a commitment to educate and personalize a natural experience for our generations. Everyone should visit a public park. Choose one close to you. Everyone should visit one or more of the many now national parks that are set aside for our personal enjoyment. Go to Niagara Falls, perhaps one of the first and preeminent natural resources that was recognized by people in the 18th century who got to go that far inland and that far west. We all need to understand by appreciation what natural spaces can do for our health and well-being. And any of a number of excellent scientific studies have been done to justify the physical benefits that come from their enjoyment. And I'm glad you brought up Biltmore as well, because that was, of course, designed as a private estate and retreat, and it's now open to the public as well for public enjoyment. And that's one great example of a landscape um, that has made that tra transition for us. Um, are there other private estates that you developed that are now public? The, the estates that were privately held were, I, I, will, I will hesitate to use the word remnants of the Gilded Age, but that is what they are. Some are incredibly well maintained, others not so much, depending upon the uh, waning or uh, increasing of family fortunes. I would suggest that that visits be scheduled to some of the great cities that 
hold urban designs that came out of the Olmsted Parks development. The Chicago parks are exceptional and visiting the conservatories or the lake frontage, uh, going to Boston and the great emerald necklace that includes the, the Arnold Arboretum, the, the, the green division of Harvard University and the waterways that attend those. There are any number of city parks designed by the Olmsted firm that include residential subdivisions like the city of Atlanta, where you can go out and drive for miles on the parkways through those incredibly well-funded and well-developed hillsides outside of the city. I think any, any easy parsing of a Google search on Olmsted parks and city greenways will give you uh, an arm's length touch with a city close to you that can be experienced with with the attitude of touring at the end of the 19th, beginning of the 20th century, celebrating urban public horticulture. Yeah, I was just visiting such a neighborhood in Baltimore not yes. too long ago, and it was beautiful. And I love the way the streets are laid out. It feels very open and green, even though you're in an urban central area. And I think it really helps with the quality of life there. Well, that was a project of Rick's. I can take no credit for that. So Rick was very much involved with that and also with the designing, you know, the, the things that we do. One of the, I would say, the, the hallmarks of an Olmsted Park system is that somewhere in that city, you will find a glass house. So if you see a glass house in a late 19th, early, early 20th century landscape design, look to see that its roots aren't somehow related to the urban parks movement. I wanted to transition to talk a little bit more about your personal life, since we've been talking mostly about your large projects and all the great works you've done. Can you give our listeners a little bit about, you mentioned your sons and your family and your lineage? Uh, my father uh, was there for all of us all of the time and in my great worldwide wanderings of discovering who I was and what I would yet grow to be, he funded a great many experiences. My brother and I traveled together over several continents, but later in life, as I was going off to find my way through a farm, he developed a case of tuberculosis and, and was urged to go to Europe. He had married a woman, and Mary gave him three beautiful children. They ended up on the uh, coast of Italy, southern coast of Italy, and I got this letter that asked me to take care of Mary and the children if anything should happen to me. He died that season, and, and of course, when Mary returned with the children, I took them into my very humble digs as the, the, the manager of the construction site that was to become Central Park. And through the course of, of getting to know her and the children, I married my brother's widow and adopted those three fine children. We went on to have children of our own. The first one, as I was considering how grand a space it was, I was hiring a new wagon and horse, and we put him and Mary and me, and we drove through the park to show off. Well, be careful that pride goes before the fall. The horse bolted, and mm -hmm. Mary and the baby were thrown clear. I broke my leg with a compound fracture and was carried to a local hospital where it was expected I would not live the night. Mary and the child seemed to be well while everyone was concerned about me. I made it through that night and the next night and through the week, but then a week later, the baby died. So my attachment to children becomes very 
special, and the fact that I walked with a cane throughout the rest of my days and into today is because my one leg is shorter than the others due to the many resets that had to be done. We had more children, and Rick, my youngest, became, for all intents and purposes, me when he changed his name. And he ran the office in Brookline, Massachusetts, until the middle of the 20th century, with more than 5,500 towns and communities designed by the firm and the children and the employees and the landscape architects and the friends of gardens and the urban politicians who wanted green spaces throughout most of the next hundred years. Wow, that's quite a life journey. And on your 200th, what type of celebrations or commemorations are happening for that? I, I don't wish to suggest anything that people would feel uncomfortable doing in public. We are in the midst of yet another transition. We survived several wars. We have built many well-landscaped and woods-filled cemeteries. We have populated them with the dead of our foreign affairs that continue to this day. I believe that there is health and resilience in recognizing the nature of public design. And I think as we proceed, the best things for us to do are to join together in celebration, if I had a choice of one, in celebration of the legacy trees that exist. Those trees within our own communities or our own states that are recognized as champions. And with champion trees, you have a direct, a direct connection with the history of mankind within and throughout our social network. If we can add a tree as a named survivor of the ages, we can understand something about what our forebears had to go through to plant it. I'll, I'll recognize one that I have passed by recently. It's in, it's in Quincy, Massachusetts, in Peacefield, which is the generational home of the Adams family. And John Quincy Adams was the second of, of the Adams name to become president of this country. And he and his wife brought a sprig of Kentucky yellowwood, a Cladrastis lutea, and planted it to memorialize the death of one of their children. This was in the 1820s. So if we celebrate anything about my 200th birthday, I believe it would be high time to recognize those actual 200-year-old entities that still exist within our own communities and praise them for the health and well-being that they have given to our culture. Yeah, we have so much to be grateful for, for those trees that are allowing us to breathe, that are giving us shade, that are sheltering us, and providing fuel at times as well. And of course, dropping leaves and providing nutrients for the plants below. I think you've hit it successfully. It's one of those things that can live that long, that does live that long. And if we aspire to a healthy old age, we will only encourage those of us among those who, who those which are among us who live to those extraordinary lengths. Here, here. So I'm going to wish you a happy 200th. And now we're going to make the transition to the man behind uh, Olmstead Lives and introduce to our listeners Kirk R. Brown. Kirk, would you like to let our listeners know a little bit about how you came about to be Frederick Law Olmstead and your garden speaking? Well, Kathy, you, you know you and I have worked together for the better part of 20 years, if not more. And through all of that, you know, I, I, I think as a fellow speaker and, and a, a coiner of phrase, I think you know that we shall not be stopped. My um, introduction to the world of ornamental horticulture was through a man named John Bartram, whose house is on the Schuylkill River in Philadelphia. He was born in 1699, and I've toured the country with him over these last um, now 15 years. 
And through that and all of his appearances, I continued to be asked a, a very easy question by people who thought they were engaging me. And the question was, so do you portray anyone else? And I would say, no, I, I, I really don't have time. But as the road got wider and the number of appearances grew to such an extent, I decided that it was only fair to take, to take suggestions, traveling suggestions from God. So I would return that question with a very simple, well, I don't do anyone else right now, but who would you think is important enough to share a message with? And, and I got numerous candidates suggested for me. But the thing about historical interpretation is that it works best when there are a lot of primary sources available, preferably primary sources that include words written by the individual, him or herself. Well, Bartram has a collected inventory of 3,000 letters. So by the time I got through 800 pages of private letters from John, from or to John Bartram, I could hear the old man in my head. Frederick Law Olmsted was an insomniac. And whenever traveling by the railroad, which he did almost 24-7 at the end of his career, he could not sleep. And instead of even trying, he would take out his notebooks and start writing. A lot of run-on sentences, a lot of interminable uh, parenthetical expressions, dependent clauses, all of the things that indicate an active mind and a slow pencil. And, and with that, you can hear how the man is thinking. And it allowed me to think more of him than I had before I began. So you collect how many biographies are out there. There are multiple volumes of his collected works put out by the Olmsted Society in Washington. And, and with all of that primary material and all of the photographs that now exist for the Olmsted history and, and the actual ability to visit places that he touched and he designed and he visited, you put all of those things together and you can come up with a compelling multidimensional personality that fits into a variety of speaking opportunities. So this is not just a gardener. This is not just a horticulturalist. He's not an architect or just a designer. He, he is far greater than the man who would be called the father of the American Red Cross and the National Parks Movement and, and urban development and residential subdivision. I mean, all of these things play a very big part in what we view as our lives today. And he was there at the beginning of most of them. So this was an easy person to focus on when I decided I needed another character, but he was by no means the, the least uh, verbose. You, you read <laughs> lengthy, you know, page after page looking for a period and the end of a sentence. And, and yet he, he is resonant in my mind because of how much he has done and how many life-affirming things he did touch. He does sound like a lot of those uh, important historical figures in the past that should they have been alive in today's era, they would have been on social media constantly, you know, sharing all over the place and be able to get that message out a lot faster and broader. Uh, but hence, the reason I am talking to you over a digital interface uh, that mm -hmm. has some potential for existing in time and space beyond either of us. Exactly. So are there any recordings from the end of his lifetime that you were able to hear his voice or anything like that? No. And and I have to be honest and say that in, in the run-up to the Chicago World's Fair, you know there was that incredible discussion of whether it was going to be Edison's electric or Westinghouse's electric that was going to power those first illuminated buildings. And and I believe that Olmsted was, was just above it all, that all he wanted was the city to be lit up at night. And he didn't care mm -hmm. who it was that got the credit for it. He just wanted it to be done. And I think that's the way he handled most of life. 
here's what we need, go out, go forth and multiply. And so we have electric lights outlining the city of, of the white city, the great white city, you know? Yeah. And I think that a lot of what he operated under was, of course, you know, point and do. And he was the visionary, not so much the dirt and the nails doer. Right, exactly. Although you have to look at what he did achieve, the great Tammany Hall political machine in New York City recognized his tremendous skills uh, in organizing day labor. Central Park was the greatest public works initiative since the construction of the pyramids. All of that land movement, all of the sculpting of the mountains and the resources, all of the digging of waterways and lakes, all of it was done by men moving soil by hand. And Olmsted was there at the end of any workday, paying the day laborers in cash. It was what he could do because he saw things, saw big concepts so much simplified that he could, in fact, point to somebody and say, you do this, because he knew exactly what he was instructing people to do. And that's a great point as well, that Central Park wasn't just a part of the city that was preserved, that wasn't built on, is not natural, is, you know, entirely um, designed by humans. And a lot of earth moving was done to make it look natural. Yes, it was the essence. Well, his great line is that he had uh, he'd been, been commissioned to design a park for the city of Montreal, then known as Mont. And, and in the middle of that city was Mont Royal. It was a big hill, a big mountain, and the center of the city that they wanted to be a centerpiece. So he came to Montreal saying, I wish to define the genius of the place. His words for what was a Latin uh, uh, common root element, it was called the genius loci. And if you go back to the Augustan age of ancient Rome, what they wanted to include in the installation and, and access to any of their parks or house gardens or atria, anything that they were putting in the ground in a natural way was its own sense of worshiping a godhead. They believed that every green space held a god. And if they could define that god and name it and recognize it, praise it and worship it, the space would be imbued with the genius loci. By Olmsted's time, that became the genius of the place. But somewhere along the line, we've lost the concept of, of grace and, and deity that existed for him in defining what otherworldly elements enter into a garden when you care for it and nurture it and enrich it. It will return that enrichment with a far greater sense of nature than anything that happens outside of the collaboration between man and nature. A lot of people feel that connection and they sense it and know it's there. We just don't have uh, the English vocabulary maybe to reflect that, that we know that there is this spirit, this this other electrical something current out there that's connecting us. There's just not a, a word for it in our language. True. So we try to give them words, you and I, mm -hmm. and genius loci is, is as good a concept as any to define this morning's discussion, which I thank you for. This, mm -hmm. this has been, a, a, you know, you don't often get to look back over 200 years with a sense of currency. I believe we mm -hmm. could be no more current than Olmsted's philosophy in living an urban public life today. So true. I will have to have you back sometime, Kirk, to present Bartram's point of view, and that will add another 100 years, I think, looking back. Adding 140 years. I'll, I'll take that. Yeah. You know, life is good. Yeah, we'll definitely have you back for that. And I encourage all those who are listening in the greater D.C. area to visit Rock Creek Park, not just the Capitol grounds, but that was Olmsted Brothers who designed that. And it is a national park. And as we've talked about in the show, free and open to all. And it's like a beautiful natural space, but definitely 
planned carefully and maintained again by our National Park Service. And today. I would I would also add in Washington, another one of the group mm-hmm. of six designers that formed the original core of landscape architects was Beatrix Ferrand, the only woman in the group, and she was a Quaker from Philadelphia, from Quaker Quaker family in Philadelphia, who worked to design and implement the beautiful gardens at Dumbarton Oaks. So if you want to see a perfectly maintained and manicured landscape of the period and out of the movement, Dumbarton Oaks is a classic example. Yeah, and so beautiful. And I'll put a link in our show notes to an uh, episode we did with Jonathan Cavalier um, discussing some of Beatrice Farron's designs at Dumbarton Oaks for those who want to listen to that. And before we sign off, Kirk, any final thoughts on Olmsted's legacy and how can listeners contact you? Please feel free to contact me on any and all of my social media. I'm daily on Facebook because I am of a certain age, but you can contact me by Googling John Bartram, Kirk R. Brown, Frederick Law Olmsted, Kirk R. Brown, and one form or another of my many position statements will come up in the array. So I think, uh, and also through you, Kathy, we have worked together enough to know that if someone contacts you, you can forward them on. It's a, it's a, it's a pretty direct connection. It's, it's a one step Mm -hmm. assignment and I would very much look forward to it. But more than that, Kathy, I think we all have to thank garden communicators as a continuing organization in today's world for promoting the benefit of talking positively about all forms of green, how to, what to, where to, and when to. For that, my association with Gardencom.org is is historic and very meaningful in my life, which is how you and I got to know each other. Yeah, and I'm going to also include a link to Gardencom, of course, and to Kirk's speaking website. And thank you again, Kirk. Thank you also to Mr. Olmsted for joining us. And I wish you happy gardening. And to you. Plant Profile, Serviceberry. Serviceberry, Amelanchia canadensis, is a small native tree which grows wild from Maine to the Carolinas. It is also called Saskatoonberry, Juneberry, Shadberry, Shadbush, and many other common names. Serviceberry is being used extensively now in native landscaping, so you can find small groves of it in many public spaces. It can be grown as a small tree or large shrub, reaching less than 25 feet tall. It is not picky about soil types, and does well in sun to part shade conditions. The trees bloom in early spring with tiny white to light pink flowers. Serviceberry also has a lovely fall color. One of the most popular varieties is Autumn Brilliance, which has blazing foliage in brilliant reds, oranges, and yellows. The berry is similar to a blueberry in size and flavor, but is much sweeter and has a small edible seed inside each berry. The seed is reminiscent of an almond in flavor. The season to pick the berries is in late May to mid-June. They do not have to be fully blue to be ripe, so pick them when they are any shade from burgundy to purple. Do so quickly before the birds get them and before any signs of rust appear on the fruit, which happens commonly in our area. The rust appears as a hard green spot on the fruit, which erupts into a coating of orange powdery spores. It's unsightly, and it will ruin any of the berries that it infects, but it will not hurt or kill the tree itself. You can adapt most any blueberry recipe and substitute in service berry. Just drastically drop down the amount of sugar or leave it out entirely, as this berry is much sweeter than the typical blueberry. Serviceberry, you can grow that. (music) 
what's new this week in the garden? Well, it was a hot week and some torrential rains came through, but they cleared out that heat and it's a perfect gardening week ahead. Over at the community garden, I harvested all the garlic scapes off of the hardneck garlic. I also harvested finally some purple pea pods off my pea plants and about a handful of strawberries every other day. In my home garden, I'm still cutting blooms off of my Olivia David Austin rose and enjoying that beautiful scent indoors. Right now I have several clematis in bloom, including jackmanai, silver moon is still hanging on, Polish spirit, and a couple unnamed varieties are blooming as well. In the local gardening world, Rooting DC is back online and virtual this year for the 15th annual Rooting DC 2022. You can find out more information about it at the Rooting DC Facebook page. It will take place on June 25th, which is a Saturday, and you can register through whova.com. That link again is on their Facebook page. It is free and open to all, and it is meant to inspire and educate about growing food in the Washington DC area. Some other online garden talks you might be interested in are hosted by our local master gardeners. So the master gardeners of Northern Virginia at mgnv.org and go to events are hosting some upcoming talks and the topics include gardens that educate and inspire, outdoor spring pruning, partnering with pollinators, and the buzz on a beekeeper. And those you can sign up for online and watch. Um, The University of Maryland Extension, uh, Maryland Master Gardeners at extension.umd.edu. Go to news and events and then to events. They have upcoming online talks that include capturing the flavor with herbs and spices, IPM in the garden, vegetative pollinator buffer, uh, deer resistant gardening, oh dear, don't eat that, and native ground covers. Happy gardening! In the new book, The Urban Garden by Kathy Jentz and Terry Spite, you'll find dozens of inspiring and creative ways to grow flowers, shrubs, vegetables, herbs, and other plants in small spaces and with a limited budget. Whether you want to grow on a balcony, rooftop, front stoop, or a tiny urban patio, turn your growing dreams into reality and build a gorgeous and unique garden that showcases your personal style while still being functional and productive. With the ingenious ideas and resourceful tactics found here, you'll be maximizing yields and beauty from every square inch of your space, while also making Making a lush outdoor living area you'll crave spending time in. The Urban Garden, 101 Ways to Grow Food and Beauty in the City, comes out this spring. You can pre-order it now at Amazon.com and Bookshop.org. Thank you for listening to Garden DC. You can become a listener supporter for as little as 99 cents a month by going to anchor.fm slash garden DC slash support. Another way to support this podcast is to subscribe to our monthly digital publication, Washington Gardener Magazine. To do so, go to washingtongardener.com. Thank you. You can find Washington Gardener online at WashingtonGardener.com, on Twitter at WDC Gardener, on Instagram at WDC Gardener, and on Facebook.com at Washington Gardener Magazine.